Hello and welcome to Wizards, Warriors and Words, a fantasy writing advice podcast. I'm Jed Hearn, author of Fires of the Dead. And, <coughs> excuse me, I'm Dirk Ashton, author of the Paternus Trilogy. And I'm Michael R. Fletcher, and I am having insane heart palpitations right now, so if I have a stroke and pitch <laughs> dead out of my chair, just ignore me, I'm being melodramatic. <laughs> Weak. Rob? <laughs> Um, I'm Rob J. Hayes. Uh, I, I'm, I'm going to say I'm the author of Drones, which is a sci-fi story, and mm. It Takes Feet to Catch the Sunrise, which is a steampunk story, because nobody has ever heard of those books of mine. <laughs> Next. A real deep cut. And we are joined by special guest, Gareth Hanrahan. Gareth, do you want to introduce Ooh. yourself to our audience? I'm Gareth Hanrahan. Uh, in terms of novels, I've done The Black Iron Legacy, which currently consists of The God of Prayer and The Shadow Saint. More on the way. And with my other hat on, I write role-playing games. Um, my CV there is like, you know, 30 pages long, so we'll go into it right now. <laughs> Excellent. And uh, today's episode is, is going to be talking about non-European settings, because we get a lot of fantasy books set in your stock standard medieval Europe. Um, and there's nothing wrong with that specifically, but I personally do really enjoy stories that push the uh, boundaries and expectations of where fantasy novels can be set. So... Gareth, do you want to talk to us a little bit about uh, Gurdon, which is the city from the God of Prayer, which I believe is still in Europe, but it has a distinctive flavour to it that feels quite original to me. Well, I mean, it's, as I, as I keep saying, say, Gurdon is inspired by like four or five different cities I've lived in uh, or, or visited regularly. So like, a lot of the geography is based on Cork, where I live in Ireland. And so the history as well in terms like, you know, but it's like, you know, you sort of take, take real world history and put it through a sort of fantasy filter. Like G Gurdon is best known for its alchemical industry. Um, and Cork does not have an alchemical industry, um, but it has an awful lot of pharmaceutical plants. I can see like, you know, three or four from my window as I look out. <laughs> and historically, it was also um, a major supplier of butter and beef to the British Navy. So somewhere in the back of my head, I sort of took those two industries, combined them together, and then took like the, the like, you know, uh, architecture of Edinburgh or London and sort of crammed them together onto Cork and basically took like, you know, real world places and put them through a sort of fancy, fancy lens. Um, I say, I'm, I mean, I'm not sure how conscious any of that was. Like I didn't sort of sit down and go, aha, I will design the city thusly. It was more that you sort of, you, if you sort of like, you know, dig into your inspirations, you can sort of identify some of them and sort of like, you know, reconstruct, your, reconstruct your, your subconscious process. Um, but being a, any fantasy is going to draw on elements of the real world. You, you, you can't, there's no, nothing, nothing is entirely original or created ex nihilio. You always start with something and warp it and distort it and change it. Great. Um, Mike, do you want to tell us about some of the settings that you've done that are more on the non-European side? Okay. Uh, for me, uh, probably the City of Sacrifice series. Um, I mean, if you look at the two covers, uh, the two books that are out so far, uh, it, it's very, um, you know, Aztec, Incan, Mesoamerican influenced, uh, very heavy blocks of stone, uh, stepped pyramids, um, I don't really have to worry about a larger geography uh, because the entire world is basically this one dead bloody desert with only a single city maintaining a life uh, left. So everything happens within that one city. Um, a, a part of it for me was, um, was treating, the, uh, what I wanted was uh, the, uh, the reader to feel, to feel the city. I like the, the same way they felt the characters. I wanted the city to be one of the characters, kind of have its own personality. I, w I wanted the city to feel its age so that the re reader, uh, you know, felt the age, smelled the sort of the sun on the stone and the dust and, you know, the, the bloody sand blowing over the walls. Um, so a lot of that was sort of architecture and really you know, capture the sense of being in something that's, that is so old that the winds have, have worn everything round, uh, you know, with p passing millennia. Did I just totally wander off there? No, that's good. <laughs> no. I, it's, I was going to get into uh, a tactic to, to give the city a personality, which uh, yes. Gareth used, which is 
give the city a point of view. <laughs> <laughs> Quite literally, yeah. <laughs> yes, that it is was, um, uh, a good it way. It was a confusing that. first chapter when you know, I picked up uh, Gutterfred. It was like, this chapter appears to be from the perspective of a building. Yes. What is going on here? <laughs> <laughs> now that I definitely really... confused me as well but it pays off like big time um yeah and it, it, Gurdon definitely feels very alive to me and there's like that sense that it is I mean not to get into spoilers massively but um you know there's things that happen yeah throughout the book that yeah really do bring the city into play as a as a major character um what kind of techniques I suppose do you use to sort of immerse readers in a place that is perhaps different to you know the normal kind of medieval European cities how do you establish that and I suppose like yeah make readers aware of the specifics of your setting without like being you know delivering a guidebook or an encyclopedia to them which you should actually do for Gurdon <laughs> <laughs> Well, didn't you write a travel guide for Gordon, actually? I'm totally changed. I did, yeah. I mean, I, yeah. I, 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 excuse me, blog posts which were, were literally that. And like, I could write an awful lot more because I said, <laughs> my day job is doing role-playing books where it's like a piece of fantasy worlds are a large part of it. Um, I mean, I, I do simply love input of me. Like, I, I could ramble on about, like, you know, architecture or politics or... Like, just, like, I, I, I love... Sort of mundane aspects filtered through fantasy uh, layer or fantasy um, lens. Like you know, uh, I've written far, far more than anyone should about like you know these sort of you know social political uh, implications of these existence of dragons. <laughs> um, but I mean, for immersing someone in a setting that's that's fictional, well, in ways you you can't as a, there's no start from scratch, but you can sort of take bits from other from different, different places and periods in the real world and not mash them together but sort of plant them together i always think of it as and there's some incredible trenches here but think of it as like sort of gardening you sort of like you, know, so you, you take like plants and cuttings from different ecosystems and like you know plant them in your garden i need to make sure that like you know the root systems work and that the the background works and you need to be aware that when you take a plant from one place you're bringing in like various like parasites and things that live on that plant, and they have to be transplant. They would be transplanted too. So if you like, you know, take, say, a uh, medieval guild and transplant it as I did into a quasi Victorian uh, setting, then you need, would need to like, you know, bring over like all these sort of pomp and circumstance or the mm. political complications of having the sort of secret guild craftsman and. Um, and you, you sort of see how the different transplanted bits interact. Uh, but the advantage of like takes up the real world is you can look at like you know, real world histories and like you know, real world places and uh, imagine those translated into your fantasy world. I think that's a really good analogy. Cool. Um, yeah, because as you say, when you do bring in these things from the real world, obviously you have total freedom with how you're using them because you're the author, but like there are going to be reader associations with certain things coming in um and that kind of segues nicely into another question i had um how do you avoid i suppose like bringing in um actually i'll just look what i wrote down because i was just forgetting it as i said it um how do you avoid like i suppose mis misrepresenting cultures um or bringing in you know like baggage because you're using a certain setting um that you don't want to bring in what, what's your thoughts on on that sort of thing um perhaps mike you could kick us off I in think that. I think I've babbled already. Let's uh, let's uh, throw okay, this one at, uh, at Dirk there. Dirk, you want to do some babbling? Yeah, <clears throat> you're in the uh, hot seat, buddy. <laughs> well, because I pull so many characters and and past locations and cultures in, um, I tried to be really very very careful um, to treat um, the the those cultures because it's not just the characters. Now, uh, with a, a kind of respect, right? And I could, I could, I could stay true to the character from myth and legend while, while stretching, stretching it quite a bit, which I do. Um, and I play fast and loose with a lot of things, 
but I tried not to, uh, I tried to draw from as many cultures as I could, but I couldn't, of course, draw from everything. Um, and um, while giving them the characteristics, um, and uh, I still tried to make them, uh, I mean, most, most of my bad characters come from, uh, you know, Judeo-Christian, and, you know, that's open season. You can just, you know, you could trash that um, uh, as much as you want. A lot of the monsters come from all different kinds of things, but they're bad in those cultures, too. Um, as far as the settings, um, I'm using, a, mine is, is urban fantasy. It's not, it's structured like epic fantasy, but it is urban fantasy, um, written in present tense, um, with shifting POVs. Uh, so it's, <coughs> it's the real world of today. Um, part of the, part of the thing that saves me is that um, these characters, many of them can take any, uh, take on any visage that they want, any avatar. Um, they can, um, they can create what they look like. So if they speak with a certain accent or they have a certain look or stink skin color, it's because they choose to do so. Um, because in their natural true, true faces, they, they, <clears throat> they're all from way beyond when humans ever came into existence, right? So, um, uh, part of part of that was playing playing with that kind of thing. The, but the settings, I don't real I don't go back and forth in time. That's not a possibility in my world. So I don't go to other settings. Um, but um, I do go to other shift to other worlds that evolve differently. Um, but I don't draw too much on any particular culture for those. I draw more on, on more or less technology. And I just touch on them, so. Rob, I'd love to get your thoughts on, um, yeah, writing stories in sort of unique and uh, non-European backgrounds. And then we can, after we've got your thoughts, we can break for our featured book of the week, which uh, Gareth will have. But before then, um, Rob. <laughs> well, I, I, I mean, Never Die is sort of, uh, a fusion of sort of um, ancient Japan and well, feudal Japan and ancient China, really. Um, and I, I knew from like when I was releasing it, I, I knew that I was going to have some people accusing me of uh, cultural appropriation. Um, and lo and behold, there are a few reviews which do. But I, <laughs> the way I tried to do it is, uh, it, it's not. It's not really based on. I, I've never been to to China or Japan, um, and so it, for me, it, it wasn't based on my experience of those or anything like that. It was literally. It, it's a book based on the movies I've seen um, and the and, and the series because it's it's a love letter to those. So for me, it was it was very much taking the sort of like the iconic bits out of you know like uh, the iconic settings out of uh, out of films like um uh hero or or seven samurai and trying to to fit those into a into some sort of world um and uh, i probably failed badly but no. i think i think oh no, definitely <laughs> not <laughs> when you're doing something like that especially as someone who isn't from those cultures, you know, I'm, I'm England, English, I'm from England, uh, it's to try not to fetishize them. Um, and, and, you know, treat them with respect uh, that, that they deserve. So that's kind of what I, I, I tried to do, um, you know, take from the, the sort of like the films that inspired me, these iconic settings and, and things like, you know, uh, when it's things like you know the buildings that are sort of more like pagodas or you know the the the, the crops that they're farming um, are, are going to be different to what you know sort of like you'd get in more European countries and try to just yeah treat it with enough respect um, and that's that's yeah kind of what I tried. Some people think I failed. Yeah, see, I I'm actually the opposite. I'm, I'm trying to I want to treat everyone and everything everything everyone holds dear, everything that's close to their heart with the sort of same level of utter disrespect. 
You basically want to completely skull fuck everything you love and hold dear. That's, that's your style in writing in general, though. It's just... That's <laughs> and know, in on, podcasting, on, as our hosts can attest. <laughs> honest, honestly, part of what I wanted to do was was have something that would insult everyone equally. So no one could say I was playing favorites. And I lied. There is one, I, I forgot, there is one... Um, an invisible island setting that shows up in book three that uh, that is based on um, Hindu and Tamil um, kind of uh, mythologies um, and stories and some other cultures in in that area. Um, though there is some Western to it, but it's based on. But I combine um, kind of the Indian Hindu um, ancient architecture with uh, the kind of um, the ancient. Cambodian. So uh, I do pull from those from those locations and settings to actually create because quite a bit of the story takes place on that on that island. Um, and it's based I spent two months in Sri Lanka. And uh, a lot of it is based on uh, things that I saw and experienced there. And actually, it's it's located in our world very close to India and Sri Lanka, but it's invisible, so. Um, I mean, the, the setting for your world is still sort of modern urban fantasy, so yeah. that, that land is just kind of, the island is like a land out of time. Um, right. Which I think is, it, I, I think it's always kind of different when you're, you're dealing with something like urban fantasy where it's set in the real world, so anything you sort of, you, you, you know, you, you draw from is that sort of like, you, you can say where it's being drawn from. Whereas if you're yeah. creating a, a right. different world and drawing from those, it's kind of like- You can't say that, right. Yeah, you know. and that's that, yeah, and that's part of what makes it easier and makes it so I can get away with it, is I can say it's actually, this looks like this and like this, right? Gareth, do you want to tell us about our featured book for this week? Um, what I'm going to plug is uh, Jeff Van Der Meer's Wonder Book. Hey. Mm. Great book. Yeah, it's busy. It's a writing guide. Um, was it focuses on basically speculative fiction on science fiction fantasy. Um, it's one of the few books that, that is like you really focus on particular genre, and it is like certainly the most useful writing book I've read. Um, because it basically talks about how, how to like to embrace imaginative stories and like you know um, build worlds and build plots and build characters that to take place in imaginative worlds. Um, there's a fantastic essay in there, which I've taken to heart by Kim Stanley Robinson, about exposition, where he basically goes, it's great. <laughs> Don't listen. If, like, you know, if, if you really care about like, you know, so, like, you know, socioeconomic and particular implications of dragons, and your enthusiasm shines through, then you can take the reader with you. Um, it's got all sorts of lovely diagrams, and it was one of the reasons I was able to Novels. So, yeah, it's, good. It, it's just as good for coming up with ideas and mm -hmm. expanding on ideas you might have had, I thought, than, I, than uh, that as, as you know, it's, it's not a how to write book. It's, it's, it, and what I love too is that, like you said, it's got all these little essays in it. And that one of my favorites is uh, a couple of my favorites are when he, they're talking about magic systems. And George R. R. Martin has a little uh, essay in there on what he thinks of magic systems, because you know there's there's kind of the Rothbard and George Nova the magic camp, systems, and then there's the the G. R. R. M. Um, <coughs> camp that you know that that the never the twain shall meet, uh, but it's it's really that's a great book. So there's Wonder Book by Jeff Vandermeer. Um, yeah, I definitely think that's an interesting point you bring up about sometimes exposition can be great. And um, I remember when we were talking about a year ago about that, it kind of did change my mind on it a little bit because yeah, I'd always sort of been laboring under the misconception that, you know, oh, you've got to avoid exposition when possible. You've got to like work it into dialogue or a scene. But some of the best parts from the gutter prayer are like, hey, here's Gurdon's train system. And like, this is how it works. And like, this is why it is laid out in this way and how it's responding to the political conditions and like the slope of the land and everything like that. And like, as a former architecture student, you know, I love those kind of details. Um, and yeah, it's just, as you say, like if you have enough passion for it and you have 
an interesting way of conveying it, like by all means, you know, readers will love that stuff. Yeah, I mean, it still has to tie into what's going on. Like, you know, yes. you, you can't just like drop a like you know, six page digression on farming unless the unless like you know, that farming is going to play into the plot later on. But yeah, I, I, I do think that you can like you know take the reader with you on, on more of a journey than just as you know, Bob. <laughs> Look out upon these skills. <laughs> As you know, Bob, the uh, tallow man, uh, relentless in their pursuit of criminals. Yes. Um, <laughs> is, there, is there any more egregious phase than, as you know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so my favorite, uh, call it trick, technique, cheat, is just burying my, uh, my, my blunt, you know, world building bits in uh, epigraphs? Epitaphs. Epigraphs little blurby things at the beginning of the chapter that has a word which i can't hmm. remember um and it's just I, I i it gives me a paragraph to tell you whatever the fuck i want about the world and <laughs> it'll always like the information in there is going to come back it's going to be important much hopefully if i do it right much later in the book but it's planting the knowledge so that when that you know detail when that thing becomes important the reader they, they might not remember why or how or where they got it from, but they know. And, and so it all fits. And so I just cheat. <laughs> Beginning of every chapter, here's a little, here's a little world building little shit. And disguised as like a holy text or a quote for, from some, you know, insane philosopher or something like that. <laughs> Judging from your reviews, like people love it. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's yeah. not cheating. Like, in the real world, there are all sorts of like, bits of information we all know. Like, you know, that... You would never like discuss in conversation, but you sort of picked up through like you know, living in this world for a while. Like, I mean, if you were writing a, a, like you know, a novel for someone who hadn't lived in the 20th century, you wouldn't have a character that they sort of picked up a mo mobile phone and went, "Hmm, I picked up my phone," and, uh, which is like you know, a telecommunications device that I can use to call anyone in the world. I, you, you, you'd, um, you just started using you know, it. Yeah, yeah, you, you should use it, but. You wouldn't necessarily go through like, you. Know, he carefully scrolled through his list of contacts and selected them. He then pressed the green button, unless you were like, doing, that, doing that for pacing purposes. What do you say? You know, he called Bob. Um, and unless you have like you know, embedded that information somewhere else, you know, like you know, sort of, it's a it's a galactica esque epigraph, whatever. Then you would be, you would be able to read it with you. Basically, to tell people the world is hard. <laughs> <laughs> what are our um we got about uh yeah about probably eight minutes or so before we have to wrap this up what are our other uh kind of top tips for yeah setting fantasy books outside of your sort of stereotypical medieval european settings research research what just do you in general research, just look like? research them <laughs> it's a bit of a, it's, it's not a very exciting tip i know but uh <laughs> be quite fun um you know if you uh -oh. find uh, a culture or something that you are particularly interested in it's fun to disappear down the rabbit holes of sort of like you know just learning about them that might take you know the form of sort of like uh you, you can find books about them you know about uh, I've, I've got a, a friend online who's been recently like devouring books about the uh the mongolian empire just mm. because he finds it fascinating and he wants to to work that sort of culture into into a story in the future um so yeah he's sort of like devouring fiction and non-fiction books on it at the moment yeah, yeah i love research. i love do it i actually am one of those weirdos who loves doing the research i mean i spent months i have hundreds and hundreds of pages of notes um and you know just i just i get fascinated by by certain areas uh particular areas of africa where um the production of iron and steel um, developed um, very, very early, perhaps the most, the, the earliest, earliest um, time in the world in history. Um, and just how those people, you know, uh, what they've learned about how those people lived um, and how maybe they came up with this where they were, what, and then I do research on what the landscape might have been a, like around that time, and the flora and the fauna, and you know that that kind of stuff fascinates me. And and 
And even though a lot of it doesn't show up in books, you can feel it as a reader um, that the author does know that, that a lot of these things that you drop in about the culture and the time and the place, um, uh, that there is something much bigger. Um, whereas I've also read books where it all seems very small, you know, where it doesn't feel like there's a greater um, world and history to this world. Um, and I, I, I honestly can't say why, what it is about one book or the other book really. Does it have more or less stuff or just in the writing style? Um, it's, it's, it's really hard for me to, to pinpoint exactly how to do it right. I, I, I'm not sure I know. I think if you've got the knowledge, if you've done the research and you've got the knowledge of it, even if you're not meaning to, to, to put it in, even if you're not meaning to sort of like, oh, I'm going to, here's a paragraph of exposition about blah, 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 blah. It'll seep in mm. over time as, as you're sort of like, you're, you're writing it. And you know, maybe even without you realizing it. Mm -hmm. yeah. Nothing beats uh, real life. Um, mm -hmm. travel. If you want to, if you want to write books, travel, meet people, go fucked up places, do fucked up things. If you haven't had a misspent youth, you've done it wrong. <laughs> life advice from Fletcher. Yeah, it's terrible advice. I'm really off a little life advice, but you should <laughs> definitely drink too much. You should definitely take a lot of drugs and experiment with just about everything, and later think, "Ooh, that was a mistake." <laughs> but do it but do it in foreign cultures do it yeah, in, yeah don't do it don't do it at home and do, do it, it before place, you have do it kids. in places where you have never been i mean it's just amazing to me that the how eye-opening it is how different people live in different parts of the world it's just um yeah shrooms in your basement are in a so lot different them. than shrooms in sri lanka <laughs> <laughs> gareth do you have any uh final thoughts on what we've been talking about before you got this one up? My thought was there, like, you know, do you remember travel? Do you remember reaching people? Uh, <laughs> yeah. what you used to do. Oh. <laughs> no, um, I guess the one sort of thing that sort of feeds into novel writing from this is you have to find the sweet spot between um, when dealing with, like, you know, um, things of finding characterization and, and like, you know, uh, character rules that are informed by what's different about your world but at the same time aren't so different they're completely accessible. Like, you know, if you're writing a uh, story about a priest or something, you want the character to be, like, you know, informed and changed by the fact that they are, like, you know, living in a temple or whatever. Um, but if you, like, you know, if you delve into, like, you know, if you look at, like, like, the lives of, like, you know, medieval monks or whatever, that they're so radically different to, in terms of, both, like, behavior and also mindset, to modern day life that becomes um, would be like um, inaccessible to the reader. Like you personally empathize with this person who's like you know every waking thought is consumed by devotion to God or whatever. But at the same time you don't you want to you don't want to basically sort of take a modern person who's transplant them into that role and go, oh I'm a monk. Sure. I hate being a monk. It's like you know, <laughs> it's really boring. I want to go for coffee. <laughs> like you know have, have a nine to five job because they wouldn't think like that. You need to find a character who can be accessible to a modern reader um, while still being interesting and different because of their the, the, the fantastical circumstances they're in. So you can sort of find that sweet spot between the two. Great. Um, well, I think that's a good note to wrap up this episode on. Um, thank you everybody for listening. Thank you, Gareth, for coming here as our special guest. Um, and we will see you all next time. Goodbye, everybody. Bye, everybody. Bye. All right, so we'll wrap that one up. Uh, your notes, Dirk, as a big book and call it Expositurnus. <laughs> <laughs> it, oh, info man. dump burnus. <laughs> Why'd you wait until the episode stopped before you did that one, Rob? Oh, man, um, I had that thought about five minutes ago and I just couldn't seem to find a way to stop it into the actual conversation. Sorry, man. Should have uh, should have let you crowbar that one in. Um, you could still leave it. Yeah, just like, have, have the episode run past just like oh yeah Rob thought of this joke <laughs> yeah they're like oh they go to stop the episode because they hear me do the wrap up and they're like there's still five minutes left what is this <laughs> hidden bonus scenes
Um, Dirk, yeah. we probably have to let you go now. Right? Yeah, I've got to run. Gareth, it's great to see you. Please. Even, see you. even virtually. Please. Shake your hand <laughs> this way. <laughs> bump, bump. No, not. not. <laughs> 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 All right, bye guys. See you, Doug. See you, Doug. Have, Doug. A great, have a great day. Yeah, you too. You too, Mom. Thank you for watching Wizards, Warriors, and Words. If you enjoyed this, please be sure to like and subscribe to the channel so that we can keep growing this and keep sharing our writing advice with more authors. Thanks again for watching. I'll see you next time.